Prime Minister Drew, thank you very much for being here. We are very excited to continue the cooperation we started last year. Okay, and with that, we'll start. You have the first question. Ah, actually, I have many questions, but I'll <laughs> limit myself. One of the things that was already said by the introduction was the fact that small nations are not always heard. Their, their voice is not heard. But you do have a, something to say because you're a doctor, and one of the success stories of your country is the fact that you have, and your region, has had a high vaccination rate. Yes. In fact, a model vaccination rate. Yes. And that's very critical for one reason besides health. Well, without health, we can't even do education, we can't work. So the question is, what lessons do you have to tell the world that you know that you can maybe transmit it to the world and follow it? Right. So thank you very much for that excellent question. On the issue of health, and as you know, I'm a practicing doctor, and I think you just referred to what I think the world PAHO might have put out, that St. Kitts and Nevis is probably the most vaccinated country on earth. I think that the lesson that that would send to the world is that having the political will is critically important, making it a priority. So in any country, for anything to really be successful, there must be the political will. And that will will translate into policies, and those policies will translate into action. So the lesson I will give to the world is politically prioritize. Once that is made, it must reach down to the community level, because nothing can really happen without the community being involved. So our vaccination success is because we took it to our community healthcare system. So the nurses walk. We bought a bus, for example, and that bus was only to travel to find children. Where there is no transportation, they walk to the homes, find the child with the mother, parents in the house, and deliver the vaccination there. So you need a political will and community action with the right policies in order to deliver and achieve such um, feats. I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Political will is fine, is necessary, I don't dispute it. The community outreach is necessary. But in order to have effective community outreach, you also have to have the people trusting you. If you look at a number of countries, including the United States, yes. there was a lack of feeling of trust. Yes. So how do you develop the trust in the community? Right, so you develop the trust by being transparent, open, and honest, even when it's tough, even when it might make you look bad in the moment. I have found that even when it makes you look bad and you're honest with the people, it develops, engenders more trust because they know if you are willing to be vulnerable, and that is something difficult for politicians to do. It means, therefore, that they will trust your word. When you speak, they will say, he has to be speaking the truth because he's even willing to put himself on the line. So I'll say to politicians to be open, transparent, and even when it's difficult to tell the people the truth. I have found it's difficult to fool the people. When you think they are fooled, they are really laughing after you. <laughs> so I will say transparency, openness, and communicate with the people honestly. Well said. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. Last year, we already talked about your vision of becoming a sustainable island state. And not only a vision, but it's a plan. Yes. So over the last year, you've implemented energy projects, you've implemented projects against the illegal use of sand mining, for example. Yes. So where is St. Kitts and Nevis now on this trajectory? And what do you do nationally and multilaterally for this objective? Well, before I get into it, I have to recognize is the Minister of Sustainable Development here. She probably didn't get to come over. We have an excellent minister that I appointed a senator in my cabinet and member of parliament who is a PhD in geography and sustainability and so forth, because you have to have the right people in place in order to drive the policy. So you can have the right policy, you can have the trust, but if you don't have the right people to drive it, that can create a gap. And so we have the right person there. So we came up with a model called the Sustainable Island State, which I mentioned, that have seven pillars. We developed this in collaboration with the University of the West Indies, for example, Professor Duncan, who
who heads this part of the University of the West Indies partner with us to help us to build it. And so we also collaborated with other organizations and NGO to come up with a solid and an idea. Now that has is the cornerstone of our strategy and out of that our roadmap as to how we are going to get to a sustainable island state. Because remember I have the shoot, the moonshot idea that we can become the first sustainable island state on earth. I really believe that. So the model says we can do it. So we are on a pathway towards that. So we are on the verge of implementing a large solar energy um, plant which is going to start very soon and will be completed in a year. It will drive about 30 percent. Then we have another one coming after that. And then we are looking at developing our geothermal energy, of course, which is on the island of Nevis. So that there's tremendous progress along that route. Also, we look at our agriculture, which also is fundamental. We have invested in agriculture. Our output has increased. We have trained much more um, farmers. We have sent, we have collaborated with Southern University in Louisiana, where I'm going, because they have joined us in this bold idea of a sustainable island state and to improve and increase food production and with that food security so we are on the path with that with the circular economy we have set up recycling with the um, republic of of, of, Thai, of china taiwan so we are setting up a recycling plant we have started already and that we have taken to the schools on the, on the for the first time so that is also developing on water end we have gone after more well where we have dug for potable wells we have also set up unfortunately or fortunately desalination plants to make water more available so on every front we are now attacking it so we have made significant mm -hmm. advancement since i last um, spoke to you That's on this so we are in a sense building the momentum towards our sustainable island states and to say from healthcare we are now going to build a new hospital which is built with the idea of sustainability and resilience against climate change, the type of materials we'll use and considering we're expecting stronger hurricanes and that hospital has already started. So and we are training more doctors as well. We are seeing complications of more heat, you know, the chronic diseases and so forth. So we are taking it to the community level where we're expanding our community um, healthcare system. So in every sector, based on these seven pillars, we are moving them along so we know exactly. So the last thing I'll say on that, we are creating a scoreboard. So at any point, you'll be able to ask, where are you on energy? Okay, we were at zero here, we are 30% there. Where are you on water? We were zero here, we're 25%. So we can actually track where we are in getting towards a sustainable island state. That's great to hear. Yes. I like your down-to-earth, practical, implementable approach. Yes. Uh, but you're very... It was mentioned before, small island states, small states around the world, and you're even one of the smaller states yes. on population wise, yes. and probably area also. So you're also a leader within the Caribbean community. So how do you, uh, let's say, advance some of your pragmatic thoughts, which seem to be very commendable? Uh, how do you take a leadership role where countries are not quite following your footstep yet? In other words. What are you doing practically on a leadership basis? Show them results. Because I think at the end of the day, I take it to CARICOM or the OECS, the regional bodies, and I'm able to, of course, advance the discussion and the argument there and able to work through different organizations within those, you know, set up. For example, I'm the Minister of Health, Social Services in the Quasar Cabinet of the CARICOM. And I'm the only practicing doctor. So if I speak on medical issues, I think they would listen. <laughs> so I have some credibility. So that credibility I can leverage. But I think what would help tremendously more than anything else is show them the results of what we are implementing to show that it's not just talk or theories or impractical things, but that implemented, they can really have these benefits. So apart from working through the organs and leveraging our voices and presenting good and strong and sound arguments is to say, okay, come, look at what we are doing. These are the results. For example, last year we were ranked to have the highest um, human development index in the region. I think that's the first time we would have reached that level. Rank above the most the more popular ones like Bahamas, Barbados, Jamaica, who had always been ahead of us. 
but I think on the issue of health and education, we're able to push it further. And so we rose above them. So then that is a strong result. How is it now saying it's is leading us? What did they do? So that I think would help us to leverage what we are doing in St. Kitts and Nevis, and that is to show them the results of what we are doing. Let me ask another follow-up question. <laughs> in the case of Africa, which we're moving for a second, right. two of the most successful countries on the continent, as opposed to the island right. states, are Botswana Correct. and Namibia. Yes. And when I mention them, and I'm very acquainted with Namibia, the other countries say, oh, those are small countries, yeah. we, uh, we, we're different. So you're also a small country even within the Caribbean. How do you address scalability that your neighbors will need? Right. So the scalability is quite important. I would now reverse the argument that before, when our country did not rank above, they say we were too small to do it. So, you, you know, so we were too small to do it. So now you can use the argument that because we are small, we did it. <laughs> so just this size alone does not mean you don't have your challenges because we have less resources on our level just because of our size. You have more resources, human resource, natural resources, leverage, you know, all of that you have an advantage in. So I don't think the size really matters. It is how you organize and it's how you set your priorities and how you get um, things done. At the end of the day, um, one has to recognize that there is a critical mass that you must have in order to achieve certain things. Sometimes we may not have the critical mass and that works to our disadvantage, right? And so therefore we have to be, you be able to use a small amount of resources in a particular way so that it can leverage the results that we are seeking to get. So we were seen as too small, so we couldn't achieve. Now you can't use the argument I'll say to them that it's because we are small that we achieve. No. Touché. Okay. <laughs> As you know, we are a lot of Columbia University students here and also from the School of International and Public Affairs, so aspiring future leaders and shapers in the public field. Yes. What is your lesson that from your years in office and of course in practice yes. um, you can give to us, to our young generation? Right. So I'll say to the young generation that it's worth it. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. I think you chose this field because you want the challenge. On many occasions, the formula does not work. Sometimes you have to make your own formula. At the end of the day, whatever you do, you have to add value. You must add value. Otherwise, you'll be doing many things. And if you don't add value, one would ask, so what were you really doing? So using your opportunity to influence public policy to position, to help to position the world for success. Those things are critically important. But when you, I would advise you, when you enter a room, let your voice be heard. You cannot rob the world of your voice, your perspective, because the world expect you, expects you to bring it to the table. Do not ever deprive yourself of that. So I will say be brave, courageous, be willing to work with others, let your voice be heard, but of course, you know, in a respectful way. And don't be afraid to disrupt. You can disrupt respectfully as well, but you can cause disruption. Because every now and then, there needs to be disruption. Because that is the only way we can really advance and move forward. And I like to talk to young people, because young people naturally are disruptors. <laughs> you have not conformed to the norms. And you say, look, this is not working. Maybe it worked 30 years ago, but I'm here to help to shake it up. But of course, respecting those who went before you because they have tremendous experience as well. And if you do that, I think you would have in your own space um, success, not success for you alone, but success for those who depend on you to be successful. So I want to leave that with you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we're looking forward to continuing this cooperation in the coming years.